password for the wireless internet. Mm -hmm. Some people were asking. This is an um, iVoucher and it's joint work of course and not the case. Uh, so I thought I'd start today by doing something really easy because we've got a long day ahead of us. So we're going to try to implement the stack in Haskell. So most of you are finished by now, but here it is. Um, <laughs> you, just, you start with the list. Then you let the type of your stack, then you write your top and your push, and it's all exactly like you do it in your head. Um, but now the next thing is we want to make sure that this is really a list and it has the, the, the stack has this last in first out property. So we write our properties and we can quick check this. And this gives us a certain kind of guarantee that what we're doing really makes sense. But we can do even better. After we've written the program and we've run the quick check, we, we might want to actually use equational reasoning and prove once and for all that uh, the last in first out property really holds for these stacks. Um, but we can do even better uh, by using proof assistance. So we can, this is Cork, you can actually you can implement the, the stack in Cork. You can write this kind of theorem which says uh, exactly the uh, last in first out property. And then you can do the proof and then you can extract your Haskell code and you can run that. So, so far I haven't done anything interesting, except that I've, uh, the, this is, I think, um, so there are three good tools we have to do kind of reasoning and uh, prove stuff about Haskell programs, and each one kind of quick check is very lightweight, you just have to state, state the property and then it, and write the arbitrary instances and that kind of thing, and you're good to go, equation <coughs> reasoning is a bit more difficult. And then the proof assistance really gives a, a solid guarantee that, um, that your, your proof is even all right. So functional programming is really great for writing high assurance software. I think um, that's what we can conclude from this. And there's plenty of empirical evidence for this as well. Um, if you want a job writing Haskell code in industry, you can work for two companies, and the one does investment banking, and the other works for the military. And this is probably <laughs> not a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, let's take it one step further. So we've mastered our stacks, and uh, let's try implementing a queue. Um, and there are different ways to do this, more ways than you might write a stack. Um, but here's one way we could do it. We could do what an uh, imperative program would do, and then build up this linked list of cells, where every cell is uh, stored in an integer and has a pointer to a next cell, and then, or a cell might be empty, which is when you have a null pointer, essentially. And then your type of your queues is just a pair of pointers to two cells, one at the front of the list and one at the end of the list. And then you can write all your NQ and DQ and empty queue functions. And now, uh, we've done this, we want to show that this program is correct. And what can we do? So we get out our reasoning toolkit and uh, see, uh, well, what have we got left? So starting from the bottom, uh, with proof assistance and equational reasoning, the problem is, if we use these I.O. reps, they don't have any transparent definition, right? There's nothing we can, we can actually have which we, we, which we can expand definitions and reason with. And uh, so these two have to go. And then the only thing we have left is quick check. But then to use quick check, we need to use unsafe perform I.O. and that kind of thing. And that really doesn't bear thinking about to have to resort to that level of hackery just to run a few tests. So we're really empty-handed, and the only thing we can do is we can kind of break out semantics textbook and do a pen and paper proof and say, well, provided that this set of semantics of mutable references uh, is an actual description of the way Haskell treats things, um, the, uh, the, the cues are OK. But beyond that, there's not much which we can do. So that's what this talk is about. There's a big divide here between pure programs on the one hand and impure programs on the other hand. So the pure ones, they're kind of easy to reason about and have a fairly clear semantics, you've got all these nice tools for your quick check and uh, lots more, we've seen this morning, and lots more coming up. And for the impure side, this, these are pretty much empty-handed, but they're really useful. We really need to write impure programs, right? Because otherwise, <laughs> our machines get hot, but they don't do anything. <laughs> um, so, okay, what's the idea? Uh, there's one idea in this paper, and it's not, it's, uh, lots of people have done similar work, but it's very simple that we want to get pure specifications of impure programs. And if you have a pure specification, 
you can actually execute this, you can debug it, you can, and you have definitions that in your hands that you can work with. Um, so in addition, we do three things. We talk about teletype I.O., which is like get, car, get character and put character, to mutual state, that's I.O. refs, and concurrencies, that's M.R.s and fork I.O. And I'm going to talk about mutual state mostly. Um, not because it's the most interesting, not because it's the most exciting, but because it's simple, and you probably have a good idea of how to do it. And it gives a nice overview of all the problems that are involved when you start doing this kind of thing. So this is the plan of attack for all these kind of specifications that we write. Um, we start with defining a monad, and this monad captures the operations, the impure operations which you want to give specifications for. Then we define a pure interface for this monad, so you can think of drop-in pure replacements to uh, new I.O. ref, read I.O. ref, and that kind of thing. And then finally we define a run function which kind of executes this and uh, gives us back a final result. Okay, so let's start with the monad. Um, here it is. So first of all, we have to kind of fix um, what kind of data we want to store in memory and what, how we model our locations in memory. Right, so uh, let's keep it simple for now. And we'll just say locations are integers and all the data we store on the heap is just an integer. I'll come back to this point because it's not perfect, of course. And then you can give um, constructors for all the operations you want to specify. So, if you want to write to an IRF, you should give the location you want to write to, to and the piece of data you want to write to, and then the rest of some uh, stateful computation. Similarly, if you want to read, you have to give the location you want to read from, and then you get back the piece of data, so this is a resumption here. So, given a piece of data, you describe how to continue. Similarly, for new, it's dual in a way. You give the piece of data you want to store, and you get back the location where that data is stored, and then you can continue writing your impure programs. And then finally you have a return which says this is where I this is where um, I end my impure computation. And this is a monad, uh, that's a good thing. It's clearly a monad actually. Uh, you've got a so return is obviously return. And bind actually all it does is it kind of traverses through all the operations, all the constructors and search for a return and when it finds a return it actually applies F. Um, you can think of this monad as doing some kind of substitution. The bind here actually substitutes all the uh, x's, or the a's, I should say, by uh, new sub-expressions built up from writing and reading and things like that. And then this corresponds exactly to substitution, which keeps the shape of the term intact, but traverses all the way down to the, um, to the return, and but actually that's where it actually does something. So far, so good? Okay. So we've defined our monad, and the next thing we want to do is we want to define a pure interface for this one. So if we have our constructor, that's actually very easy to do. So uh, we have our right IO ref, which takes location and a piece of data and uh, does some IO which returns a unit. And the obvious thing to do is you can say write uh, to this location, this piece of data, and return unit. Similarly, you've got read IO ref, which you pass the location. And then you have to give a function which takes a piece of data and then to a uh, function from data to IO sub S of data. And that's return, of course. Similarly, for new IO ref, uh, you create a new reference and then return the location that you get back. OK, so what can we do? We've written this. We've written the monad instance so we can actually write programs now. So here's one. So that doesn't do anything interesting, but you can see kind of the style that you can program uh, with pseudo IRFs, which are actually pure, have a pure specification behind it. Okay, so we've now done the first two, and now we need to define a run function. And this is uh, where the, the real work starts. So I'm going to use the state monad um, because it keeps things a bit clean and I don't have to carry around all the state explicitly myself. Um, so what am I going to do? The run should take something in this monad and then return the value of type A. And I'm going to pass in some empty store, which is the state stored by the state monad, um, just to kick off the computation. And I'm going to evaluate, run the, uh, evaluate the state monad, basically. And then this run IO state function takes one of these IO sub S uh, of A computations and builds a computation up of the state monad, which we can then execute. OK. So how do all these functions look? Oh, first, store. Um, we have to fix our type of store. And there are two pieces of information we're generally interested in. We want to generate a, a fresh location. So that's what this fresh counter says. 
And this heap is just a, a map from locations to data. Um, I could use the list here and use the indexing, but this works uh, just as well. And the empty store just starts off with a uh, the first location which we can allocate being zero, and an undefined heap. So that's already a bit worrying. Um, I'll come back to that again. Um, okay, now how do all our constructors look for this? So we still need to define this run IO state, which takes one of these data types and gives the state for computation that it corresponds to. So we're going to go through the constructors now one by one. Uh, so return is obviously, it's just going to return, but now uses the return of the state line. So it leaves the state untouched and just returns the state. To read um, is slightly more interesting. We use the state one that we're in to look up the heap, and that the heap is a function from locations to data. And then the run IO state, right, what, what ingredients do we have to continue? We have an L, which is a location, and a read, which is a function from data to more IO. So we can apply H to L to get a piece of data. We can feed that into the read and then continue uh, doing our IO like that. So write, of course, needs to update the heat. So what happens here? Uh, once again, we access the store, and then we update the heat here. So what we're doing is um, we're uh, overwriting the old heat with the new one, and that's what this update function does. And what does update do? Well, you get the location and the data and an old heap, and then you get the new location that you're looking up. And if the new location you're looking up is the one you're meant to be overwriting, you return D. And otherwise, you look up the value of the old heap. And then, you can, of course, you just continue with the rest of the um, I.O. computation. OK, so that's uh, right. And then new, um, once, once again, uh, you can play this, you can probably figure this out yourself. You need to get a fresh location, you update the location, and you extend the heap, and then you continue uh, the computation with this new location. I haven't written extend heap here, but it's exactly the same as on the uh, previous slide. OK. Now, if we had chosen this to be our data type, uh, the type of data stored in the heap, essentially, we can actually quick check our queues. <coughs> and we can do more than just quick check to see what happens when we run these queues to see if, um, if they're last in, last out, or first in, first out, rather. Um, but you can even check properties of kind of uh, how, how much heap gets allocated. Because you have this pure heap value that you can inspect, you can poke at it and uh, ask questions about it. One of the things we do in the paper is we show that you can do Q reversal in constant memory. So that, does, that means that the fresh counter doesn't, alloc doesn't allocate any new memory, it doesn't get incremented. Right, so where does this break down? Um, first of all, the heap we wrote can only store integers. Okay, that's too bad. Uh, what can we do about that? So what we did on the previous slide is we defined our own variation of data. And then we can work with that, and that's fine. Um, what a real implementation should do is use data.dynamic. And uh, there's a trade-off here. If you use data.dynamic, so that uses unsafe coerce uh, under the hood, and you can keep kind of fa use phantom types to make sure that your IO, that your IO refs don't go wrong, and that you don't uh, that as long as you kind of program against this pure interface, that you never really do anything particularly nasty. But um, that's fine if you want to quick check your code. But as soon as you actually want to do any kind of equational reasoning and you've got these unsafe coerces and all this kind of mess lying about, this really, really breaks down, right? Um, okay, so what's the overview of the others? Very briefly. Um, you can read all the details in the paper, but just so you get a taste of what else is in there. So we've got the teletype specification for get character and put character, and that takes its input to stream of characters. And then the output is kind of interesting, um, because it's uh, essentially a stream of maybe characters, where just means, uh, here's the character I just printed, and nothing means, at this point I actually read a character from the input before I can uh, produce more output. And of course, it also returns a final value. Um, we've also got concurrency, and that's also parameterized by a scheduler. And so this is the type of how we module our schedulers. Um, the idea is, you pass in an int, and you say, I've got this many threads running at the moment. 
and it'll pick an integer which is less than this integer you pass in. So between, if you pass in n, it picks in something between 0 and n minus 1. And it gives you back a new sketch. And when you run these things, you get out a final heap and the result. Which, and the, the heap now also stores information about uh, which threads are active and how many threads have been spawned off and that kind of thing. OK, so like I said, we can quick check our code. But the other two drop off, and that's a real worry. Because um, it's really useful sometimes to have a machine check your proof or to be able to get a pen and paper and do a proof by hand and know how your code behaves. So can we not do better than this? Uh, kind of, uh, yes, we can. Uh, oh, I've messed up my slides somehow. OK, sorry about that. Uh, the problem is really. I'm using, OK. So what are the problems? We can't use data.dynamic, uh, data and I'm using undefined values. Those are two problems I've worked out so far. Uh, so the undefined values was the initial heap. And you can imagine, because we model uh, memory locations as integers, you can actually invent your own integer and try to look up what's stored at that location. Um, so and then what happens? Well, it's kind of unspecified. So, what we really need to do is we need to somehow talk about the size of the heap, the types of data stored on our heap, the, uh, what, 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 so we use locations as just any integers, but we want to talk about integers less than a certain size uh, n. And for that, it seems like um, we might be able to use uh, sexy types, but Haskell's types aren't quite sexy enough. Uh, we, we really need a kind of the Angelina Jolie style dependent types, which are uber sexy, where you can do all of this. And um, I, I, so there's, there's a, there's, it's a success story on the one hand that you can now quick check I.O. programs, but it's unfortunate that Haskell quite, isn't quite up to scratch to do what you really want to do and write a, kind of a pure and total and beautiful once and for all specification of uh, of heaps and references and all everything you uh, like to do. And for that, you need just a stronger type system. Um, and OK, you can call my bluff if you want. Uh, I've done it in 100 lines of data. Heterogeneous pointers, uh, uh, impossible to reference, unallocated memory, all that, everything you really want. OK, so there's a lot of related work, of course. Um, there's one interesting point which the referee pointed out is the pre-monadic versions of the Haskell report. So very old versions of Haskell did this funny thing with uh, IO was a function which took it in a stream of requests and produced a stream of responses. They actually had an addendum or an appendix which said, and this is how we specify how it actually should behave. And, um, but that was dropped. Actually, as soon as Monad stepped into the picture, they said, uh, we don't need to do this anymore. So that's a bit unfortunate. Yeah. So, oh well. Um, there's the awkward squad, of course, and the awkward squad is a great paper. If you don't want to learn about how to do I/O in uh, in Haskell, read the awkward squad, and it does some semantics. It tries to give kind of a precise intuition about how these things should behave, but it's not. It's it's hard to use. I think that's the bottom line. If you really want to uh, prove anything with the semantics presented there, it's really really hard. And at least with this, you can. Quick check it, execute it, uh, do some equational reasoning, and that's fine. And of course, there's a lot of work on semantics of effects, and I'm not going to talk about all of that. Um, so there's a package on package where you can actually download it. Uh, it has a homepage, which is just here. And um, the version 0.1, which is on package, is uh, the one which has all the code in the paper. Um, there's another version coming out, which is a lot more exciting, I think. Uh, which allows you to kind of combine effects. So you can, all these monads that I write have a very uh, fixed structure. They have one return constructor and then one constructor for every um, function you want to implement, for, for every pure function you want to specify. And that gives you a, a crib when you want to combine these monads. And it's really nice, but there's a very nice trick you can do, which allows you to assemble these monads entirely modularly. And so that can really splits up the I.O. monad into small chunks. Which is very nice. And also does some STM and other stuff. Uh, 0 0.2 is in dark, and I'll release it once um, Haddock can do infix type constructions. 
Uh, so here's the summary. <laughs> Here are the big slogans that I want you to remember for this talk. Give a pure specification of impure functions. That's the big idea behind everything. And to do that, it's the three-step thing. You define your data type, you give it a pure interface which you can program against, and you define your run function. And then if you have a strong enough type system, you can actually make these things total. Make them fully safely executable, reason with them without having to worry about bottoms and all that. Okay, so I think we'll stop there. So what happens if I try to encode this, the standard implementation of unsafe coerce, where you make an IRF, read from it, write to it at one type, and read from it at a different type? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, using data.dynamic, you mean? If, if you have a heap which, which is kind of uh, right. What would happen? You'd still you get an error as well because uh, yeah yeah because um, because the coercion would go wrong in uh, the unsafe coerce would fail basically. And what will probably happen is um, so from dynamic returns adjust which might fail. And if you use I just throw away that information. And I mean I could give a meaningful error and say uh, you're trying to do something very nasty. Please don't. But uh, <coughs> that's about as far as I can get. So that's, that's good. The specification of unsafe coerce is undefined. Uh, well, you can still write it, but yeah. But the, the, the result is all the bottom. Um, what, well, unless, unless the types match up at runtime, then it's bottom. But the type, if the types, I mean, I'm saying if, so what's your question? One more time. No, so, 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 that's, so that's good then. It, it, it gives us bottom when the types at runtime don't match. Um, or it could say, say nothing, or, yeah, let's give you both. So, so yeah, it's yeah. a reasonable, it's a reasonable. You, you can write that mean. unless you use unsafe before my own. But you can write you can write the spec kind of uh, version of it, and then try to reason with it, and then it'll uh, collapse when you do it at runtime. But if, if you write the pure version of it and use write it unsafe coerce against this pure interface, and then you try to run it, it'll be undefined. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, that's a good thing. Good. Yes. Uh, uh, Simon. So you. Um, uh, I think your story is we can regard imperative if we regard our imperative programs as purely functional programs mm -hmm. over space, then we can use our existing tools. Right? Mm -hmm. But the imperative guys have this <coughs> enormous industry of stuff to do with separation logic and whole triples and stuff to reason mm -hmm. about imperative programs. Yep. And I'm having trouble believing that somehow magically, just by regarding it as a function, all of that stuff isn't still necessary. Right. So um, there's definitely further work here. If you look at, um, <laughs> I'm not saying this is the whole story, but if you look at um, work by Alex and Nevsky and Greg Morissette, for instance, where they do war type theory, and uh, one thing which we'd like to do, for instance, is it, what, because, so the idea behind this war type theory is on the type level they encode kind of war logic stuff. And instead of giving implementation of read IORF and that kind of thing, they kind of make some actions and they reason with that and say that's how it behaves. But what we can do is, if you have a total uh, implementation of these things, you can on top, of, on top of that build kind of a reasoning layer which says um, it, it satisfies the actions of war type theory, so anything that you prove in there is also valid in, uh, by this, by, uh, through this specification. But it's going to be just as hard to prove your programs as it is. Well, no, I'm, I'm just not. Uh, if, if, you, if you prove that. Uh, our implementation satisfies the axioms of the whole type theory people. All their proofs go through, an, uh, through, through our specification there. And, and I'm uh, sure there's more you can do with separation logic and all kinds of stuff. Uh, Ralph? I have a more technical question. For mm. the specification, you are using almost the free mode now. It's so so all it's the constructors, or all the functions are used as constructors. Yes. But it's almost the free mode now because. The bind operation is not interpreted syntactically. Yes, so is. why is that? And yes, why don't you use the state monad in the first place? Oh, okay, yes. Okay, this is a... Uh, this... Right, you're entirely right. And this is an observation you can make um, about the stateful computation. You don't really need the state monad, but you can run them, you can execute them directly. <coughs> There's a good reason to do it this way, and it has to do with when you want to introduce more things or combine them. The nice thing about free monads is um, they're 
left air joints, they preserve coke products, so if you want to plug them together with coke products, it's super easy, because you just plug the underlying functors together with coke products, and that's all very nice. And um, if you have this common interface, which says uh, everything is a free model, and you can uh, stick them together, that makes for much nicer modularity. And then if you actually want to run them, you can build a lower level virtual machine which kind of on which you can execute these big free monadic terms. So that's in the next version of you. Yes, it's, yeah, it's gonna, it'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay.